last week we talked about the five different theories of change. I just want to make sure we're always on the same page. Personal transformation, uh, alternatives, inside game structure, and mass protest. We talked about that last week. Boop, 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 boop. Beautiful graphics. Thank you so much. Some of the core points that we made last week and that I want to make sure we reinforce is number one is that theories of change do exist and organizations are driven by theories of change. This is very, very important to know because different organizations are driven by this particular ways that they understand the theories of change, right? Two, there can be primary and secondary theories of change in organizations. This is important because you might have an organization that says, well, Carlos, we use uh, community organizing or alternatives and we use personal transformation. We use both and that's true. The real question is whether you use one to meet the other one. That's what we call primary and secondary. So some people say, well, Carlos, we do community organizing or structure. We bring neighbors together to organizing, push them on an issue, and we do leadership development, some personal transformation to get those neighbors to become leaders to then do the organizing. So in that context, we will say that primary theory of change is structure and the secondary is personal transformation, just to give you a sense, right? So I share that 182, 83. Sorry, my screen is a little weird, but we'll do it this way. I guess we'll improvise. Okay, so primary and secondary theories of change in organizations. Uh, so I hope that people understand that because sometimes uh, when we are really trying to map map the map, you know what, where the different organizations are at, it's important to understand and make that distinction. Okay. Three, organizations create cultures to protect their theory of change. Uh, this is kind of important because the um, the inside game creates a particular way that they're going to do their inside game. People wear suits. Is that true? to go to the state house or to Congress to lobby. They're trying to be formal. They have a particular view. Not everyone on the inside game has that culture, but each theory of change sometimes develop a particular type of culture into how they relate to whoever they're relating, right? And organizations create cult because of that, but also cultures can undermine their collaboration with other theories of change. So I'm not gonna get into that right now. I'm gonna get to it in later. Uh, let's see. I think it's important to say this line. I'm not a particular fan of Peter Drucker, but I think this line is pretty good, which is called culture eats a strategy for breakfast. And what does this mean is that sometimes when we're saying, well, why can the mass protests collaborate with the inside game and stuff? It's because the culture is meant to protect it. So sometimes it doesn't allow for collaboration. And uh, whatever is your organizational culture, that would always dominate more than sometimes where you want to guide your organizational strategically. Okay. Uh, I will say number four point is theories of change are part of a tradition, meaning that there is a lineage. So, for example, uh, I think I was sharing with all of you last week about in Occupy, the Occupy movement that, that started here in the U.S. I think nine years ago. Uh, the model of assembly, you come in, you do assembly, you vote with your fingers, you do the sparkly fingers, you do, a, there's a whole methodology to the action, the encampment itself, and then also to uh, make decisions in, in the larger assembly. That is not from Occupy. That comes from uh, the anti-nuclear movement in the 70s in the U.S. So, so what we mean by that is that these different theories of change come from a lineage. There is a lineage that is informing how these things are. In the US, we, our structure tradition is made from, it's, it's, it's mainly made by, it's, it's broken down racially. And on the white side of the tradition is made by a guy called Solalinsky that wrote a book called Rules for Radicals about maybe 40 years ago. So a lot of the tradition comes from him. And of course, if you keep going back down, it's from the labor traditions that came from immigrants that came from Europe, right? So it's important to understand that there is implicit assumptions that the tradition of the lineage has made that then now you are implementing, okay? Because there's tradition, then there is genealogy. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. <sighs> Perfect, okay. So let's get to the meat of this thing. So let's take a deep breath if you're over there. And 
we said there is theories of change, there's personal transformation, there's inside game, there's alternatives, there is structure, there's mass protest. I know you all been seeing what's happening with the murder of George Floyd. There's a humongous movement of mass protest right now here in the US. I hope that you're beginning, you're seeing that and how that is manifesting, right? So one of the biggest things is that you already done strengths and weaknesses. You kind of see uh, what are the strengths on one theory of change? What is the weakness of each theory of change? And the biggest thing that we want to talk about is that there's conflict among the theories of change, okay? There's conflicts among the theories of change. Now, you would normally, uh, let's go back, let's see. So we go back to the pie. Where's my pie here? Oh, this is so good, I can do this. Okay, so how many people here, let me see, I'm gonna to try to see if I can find the chat somewhere. How many people here you feel that you relate much deeper with personal transformation, that that is a theory of change that you identify with, that you have experience, some of some experience on that you prefer. Just raise your hand just so I can see it. Okay, let me see. So I see some, some folks with, with personal transformation, some people so-so, that's okay, no worries. But I'm looking for the strong ones that you identify, you feel like somewhat protective of personal transformation. Just raise your hand just to see again, just to see again, beautiful. How many people feel strong or that you feel uh, relationship or uh, that you know some of it about alternatives? Just raise your hand. Alternatives, alternatives, alternatives. Great, great. Some people similarly. I see Michael raising his hand much more stronger for alternatives. That's great. Uh, how many people for the inside game, inside game, that you feel that that's what you've been part of, that that's what you've been doing? I see some people raising their hands. Beautiful. How many people for structure or community organizing? Just raise your hand. Oh, great, a lot of people, perfect. How many people for mass protest? How many people for mass protest? Great. Let's take a deep breath, everybody. Now, what we're gonna do in the next five to 10 minutes, just to understand the conflicts, is just an exercise, okay? We're gonna take our hats of who we are right now and we're gonna pretend to be other movement people, okay? Are you ready for doing some of that? You're gonna take, what you're gonna say right now is not you, it's other movement people, okay? Let's make sure we understand that, okay? So there's no judgment in whatever you choose, you're just representing what you heard before on other people, okay? So how many people feel, how many people uh, you have feel, if I've heard that there's a lot of critiques about the inside game? How many people have heard other people say critiques about the inside game? Perfect, so I see a lot of people doing that around the inside game, beautiful. And when people say those critiques about the inside game, did they say it in a nice way or did they say it in a very mean way? Hmm. What, normally, if you were in a room with me, we will talk about it with 100 people in the room and we will fight it out essentially, because that's when you really understand how this works. But what are some of the things that people say about the inside game? What are the critiques that people say about the inside game? You can put it on the chat. Let me see how I can see the chat. What do people say about the inside game? A ver, a ver, a ver. The people are just in it for the power. They're co-opted. Oh, traitor, Liz, wow, right on the gut. Sellout, holy guacamole. Watered down, being brought in. The system is a problem. You never change it from the inside. Wow. It's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> a privilege. Wow. All of you are so mean. That is insane. <laughs> Beautiful. Take a deep breath. Shake it all out. Shake it all out. Shake it all out. Makes sense. That's not you, though. You're not criticizing the inside game. You're just saying what you heard from other people. That's why they said when you were drinking, you know, a beer or drinking water with other people, that's what you heard. Perfect. Now, what are the people in the inside game? What do those people say about the people that are doing alternatives? What are some of those mean things that they say about their mean critiques? Hippies, waste of time, unemployed, it will never work. Oh my Lord, this is an aggressive chat. Tree huggers, naive, get a job. Dreamers, oh my Lord. 
escapist, yummy mummies, and realistic, rebels without a cause. Oh my lord, you are all so mean. This is insane. I didn't know there was this level of anger in Ireland. This is intense. Okay, shake it all out, shake it all out, shake it all out, shake it all out. What do people in alternatives? What do they say to the people that are doing structure or community organizing? What What are the critiques they say to them? Hmm. Hobbyist, too angry. Hmm. For timers, herding cats. Oh wow! I don't have the time. Wow. What do people in the rest of the ecology say to people in personal transformation? Wow. Ego trippers, self absorbed. Why bother? Wow. Wow. <laughs> when will be dirty for the real work? Wow. This chat is so mean. This is crazy. Wow. Okay. But this is good to read, though. <laughs> I see some people laughing. I see there's some pleasure happening in this chat. It's okay. No worries. No worries. It's not you. It's all the people. You're just being channels for other people's angers. Now, what do people say? What is the, the critiques that they say uh, about mass protests? What are the things that everyone says about mass protests? You know, from the from inside game, from structure, from personal trauma. What do they say about mass protests? Dangerous. Oh, man. Cause more harm than good. Go to school. Oh, wow. Troublemakers obstructing decent, hardworking people. Wow. Wow. Rioters. That's the one we're hearing about to this week. Wow. Antifa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, deep breaths, everybody, deep breaths, everybody, deep breaths, deep breaths, deep breaths. Okay, so can we have some honesty? Would that be okay? Do you want to have some honesty? Yes or no? Yes, you can do this. I can see your face. Beautiful. How many people feel that there is, we said last week, strengths and weaknesses, correct? No theory of change does not have a weaknesses. All of them have weaknesses. Does that make some sense? None of them is perfect. We also said that each theory of change could be used for co-opted ways. Does that make sense? Or revolutionary objectives. So we're, of course, each one could be for either. I don't know if that makes any sense. Personal transformation could become just, uh, you know, self-help, luxury financing for retreats. Are you following me on this? Versus actually a transformational real changing people's lives and committing to have an ethics for the world, right? So the same thing used for different reasons, right? Uh, but how many of you have actually do have heard other people say those critiques? Now, that those particular critiques, as mean as possible. Just raise your hand if you've seen them. Just see, raise of hands. Beautiful. In honesty, how many people, how many, how, how many times have you done some of those? You said those things. Beautiful. Some honesty here. Now, the reason why, and we can let's take a breath and let's let it all out. Now we're going to take those hats representing the world and we're going to put back our hats of representing ourselves, right? So we were just doing a little experiment. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted all of us to just understand that is because there is a lot of conflict between the theories of change. There is humongous amount of conflicts. Okay, there's books written trashing the other ones about why one theory of change is better than the other ones. Does that make sense? And here in the US, there's tons of books about community organizing is the only way the movements of the 60s were a bunch of failures, you know? There's right now happening, right now what's happening on the streets here in the US, I can tell you. People are like, oh, it's just a flash in the pants, what's happening with mass protest. All those people are gonna go home, they're not gonna come back to join the real fight of organizing. Does that make sense? There's all that. People in personal transformation, same to people in structure. All of you are a bunch of burnouts. All of you are sellouts. You know, you're co-opted. It's all kinds of critiques that people say about that, okay? 
again, I said, there's a lot of conflicts between the theories of change, okay? A lot of conflicts around the theories of change, okay? And one important thing to understand now that you're seeing the conflicts is that actually each theory of change, once you do the mapping of weaknesses, the strengths and weaknesses, each theory of change needs the other theories of change in order to have what we call movement ecology, to have a greater collaboration, okay? This is really, really important, okay? So there's conflicts, okay? And that's a separate thing. And there's complementations, which is how the theories complement one another. How do they form a yin-yang of complementation between all the theories of change? And usually what we see is that in different movement moments, there's different moments which each theory of change for the whole movement is more needed than others, okay? This, there's a moment where mass protest is center stage. There is a moment where community organizing are center stage. Does that make some sense? And everyone kind of has to support one another, okay? That supporting of one another is what we call movement ecology, okay? And we're saying there is humongous interdependence around these theories of change, okay? Now, one thing uh, that I wanted to share with all of you is that uh, we at INI, what we do a lot is we do a lot of research because I, you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I come from the immigrant community. I, I was undocumented in this country for 10 years. My family members are still undocumented. My brother's still going through that. You know, I can tell you that I came to the movement because the movement saved my life, right? And I never wanted to do a training institute because I hated training institutes because I'm like, what are, you know, who are you to tell me, you know? But I did a training institute because we succeeded in a lot of ways with what we were trying to do after decades, you know, after a decade of organizing. And I was like, it's time to share some of these things. And then, of course, we keep doing the organizing. And in the last five or six years, we done a humongous mapping on hundreds. At, uh, we're right now in the... Um, hundreds of campaigns, but we've done about 83 movements across the world, you know, from whether it's around any issue, around different continents, you know, we map them out because they're historical. I said five to 15 years, right? And when we uh, look and we have this, we look at what are the top 10 movements that have, not from the place whether they succeeded the most um, in their objectives only, but the ones that were able to get the most amount of people, be the most synergetic, the most successful, the more longevity, right? When we look at like our top, top 10, what we noticed, and it was stupid for us not to notice this, is that they all had humongous collaboration between all the theories of change. Humongous collaborations. That, of course, we call that movement ecology. It's like a movement synergy, you know? And movement ecology is the capacity of organizations with different theories of change to come together and collaborate, okay? This is really, 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 really important, okay? One of the organizations that right now in present today has an amazing movement ecology is the movement of landless peasants in Brazil, the MST. I don't know if people are familiar with the MST, but uh, 35 to, I think they're in the 35 or 40th year now, uh, as an organization of landless peasants where they take land, um, to you know, take land to make settlements for landless workers and they turn them into uh, villages. Uh, and then they do, they distribute the labor, they do political campaigns. They do so many things. They're an amazing, amazing model. Actually, I don't know where my book is, but Rebecca Solnit brought up a, a master book on the, on the MST last year called Occupy Schools Occupied land, occupied schools. I got to get you the name, but it's Rebecca Solden. It just came out last year. It's, she spent 10, 15 years with the MST. It's just amazing. Um, so not only has been the MST one, the Indian dependence movement had a humongous model of movement ecology. Uh, Sarvadia in Sri Lanka had a humongous process of movement ecology. So we see that massive collaboration. And I wanna show you a little bit how the collaboration looked like so you understand that complementation, okay? So if you look at slide 17, I hope you can see it, is what you have is that first we have to understand that at the beginning of the movement, the movement mostly starts in personal transformation and alternatives. 
people have to go through a process of uncovering uh, who they are and what their issue they're fighting for, okay? For people that are in oppressive situations, this is a process of decolonization, it's a process of liberating themselves that sometimes happens in small groups, in small collectives, right? There's a process of liberation, of personal transformation, okay? Uh, for us in the immigrant rights movement, it was a process of young undocumented people sharing their stories because here in the U.S., we were not allowing schools to share our stories, say that we were undocumented, even if there were two million of us, okay? So there's a process of that. And the movement at the beginning doesn't have political power. So a lot of the things you're trying to do, you actually get, you cannot get them through the state, so you get them through alternatives, okay? So for us, was about getting... Uh, how, do we, how can we go to college? How can we support ourselves financially? How can we get emotional support? So we form all these groups and organizations to raise money, to support each other, to figure out how to talk to the institutions, a whole network of alternatives, okay? Usually, uh, there's a humongous personal transformation alternatives at the beginning of the movement. Some people just say, that's all we need, okay? But really where the synchronization of this comes in is that the people in the alternatives become part of the community organizing and the structure. They first develop a base of people, okay? Because they're connected. They know that they're eventually are gonna engage the dominant institutions, okay? They know that the alternative needs to be supported by the majority of the people so that it becomes a status quo. That's the whole point, right? We're trying to build an alternative world at the end of the day. We're trying to make the alternative the mainstream, right? We're trying to bring justice to the world, not just for a few people, okay? So alternatives mix with community organizing, so all the leaders from alternatives can move into structure and community organizing, okay? And so they can mobilize the base, they can build resources, okay? And then the structure, what a structure does is a structure pressures, leverage the inside game, pushes the people in the inside game to get the right reforms, Okay, not, not the right reforms, of course, in each country that's based on your political analysis and what feels reformist versus not, but they push the inside game, okay? They push the inside game to do that, okay? The inside game can use its platform to elevate movement issues, legitimacy, recruitment, for example. Most of the inside game we have across the world sucks. Let's just be honest. It sucks. It's co-opted. Most of the inside game sucks, but there's been inside game that is really amazing. For example, in the United States, and I, I tell you that because that's where I live, you know, we have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I don't know if you heard of her. They also go by the short name AOC. Okay, sending love to AOC. Amazing, you know, amazing sister from, from New York. And what AOC does is that AOC was able, with, with the help of mass protests, remember the protests that happened around the Green New Deal about two years ago? when they mobilized to, the, mobilized to Congress and AOC introduced the legislation of the Green New Deal with Edwin Markey, right? There is a way where the inside game can really move and create a platform from broad issues, okay? Whether you like him or not, Bernie Sanders has also created a platform for a lot of issues, okay? Now, of course, I'll have, a, I have you can read my articles criticizing Bernie and the campaign. I'm a, you know, I'm a big supporter, but... I have a lot of critiques, but that's for another webinar. But the inside game can do that. And the way that it creates synergy is the inside game has to protect the alternatives. So that the alternatives can be stronger and we can go on the cycle again, okay? Usually there's something in the middle, which is mass protest. And this is where things get really, really cool because the people in mass protest, they go through a wave up and down, okay? They go to the up and down of a lot of excitement and then they lower, okay? In the lowering is where, if you have a good movement ecology, all those people get absorbed into the structure and the alternatives. It populates the whole ecology. That's what, they have a system, they have coordination, where the people at the protest are also the people from the alternatives, are also the people from the structure, are also the people for personal transformation, and they're looking because at that moment, when there is a moment of the whirlwind or a trigger event, which is what we're experiencing in the US, where most people coming out are not from organizations. I hope people understand that. Most people coming out are not from organizations. They don't have membership. They don't have clear leadership. It's decentralized, it's different. So the movement has to orient to decentralization to be able to absorb all those people for the next wave of mass protest, okay? This is how you can make a movement that takes 15 years, maybe take five. If you have a system of movement ecology, okay? then mass protests can shift political power, can recruit a lot of people, and make the alternatives grow. 
This is very important. So in Brazil, what we have seen is that the MST has settlements that they organize people. They have uh, the MST's fascinating story, and you know what they're doing. They have 1.5 million families in settlements that are doing of uh, 15 families each that are doing their own farming, that are doing their own taking care of the land. That are they, they have their their smallest training of personal transformation and development is six weeks. When we talk to the MST, when they come to the U.S. and we hang out with them, they say to us, Carlos, how long are your trainings? And we're like, oh, you know, seven days, 10 days. And they're like, 10 days? That's nothing. We do six weeks as the first training. Just to give you a sense of the revolutionary process that they have of personal transformation and leadership development. And that training is for everybody. Or the 1.5 million that gone through a version of that, okay? They have levels of training and so forth and so on. Then they do campaigns to take school committees because a lot of the things that they're doing in a lot of the different areas where they organize is to, is to be able to get more uh, support for public education. But in a lot of the rural areas where they're operating, there's no public schools. There's very little ones. So who do you think builds the school? Who do you think become the teachers of the school? The MST. They have a whole, uh, Rebecca Solnit in the book that she wrote that I told you about, I think it's Occupied Land, Occupied Schools. Uh, Rebecca Solnit says the MST it's also one of the biggest, uh, has been, become one of the biggest propellers in, 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 in new education across Brazil and, and a leader across the world. They are in so many public schools where they teach MST curriculum about the movement, about the history of Brazil, the racialized. It's amazing what they've done. Then they mobilize all the teachers and the students to the mass protests to protect the encampments. It's a whole synergetic system. Then they also have cooperatives where they do... Uh, different economic where they do agroecology and all other things. Who do you think are the people that buy from them? It's people from the movement. So it's a synergetic process where you're protecting the alternatives, you're making them grow, you're making people become leaders so that they can join community organizing campaigns. You're very connected to the mass protest so that you can absorb all those new people and you can really guide the demands of the mass protest. Okay, this is very, very important. Okay, and they're leveraging the inside game. They have people that, you know, they, I don't know if you're of the, the workers' party in Brazil, the PT and Lula, they, they were all, you know, PT party, the base of the PT party is the MST, you know. So I'm going to stop right there for a second just because I wanted to show you this. And, and, and the last thing that I will show you, just so you understand the synergy of this, is that you can say, well, Carlos, I don't know, we'll done the research and we can show you some of the things. But one of the things that sometimes we're fascinating by is what happened in India. So I don't know if people have heard of the salt march, uh, you know, where they dramatized uh, the tax against the tax on salt against the British, right? And they pretty much the whole revolution on just salt. Okay, this is fascinating because they also, if the Indian, the India flag has the spinning wheel on the flag. I don't know if you've seen them, where people were, where people were doing the they were doing the spinning cooperatives. They had a whole boycott on uh, British uh, cotton because they, that was coming from, from, from Britain and they had a whole boycott to say, no, you gotta do your own cotton, you gotta own your own sadi, you gotta make your own clothing so that we can be autonomous and not dependent on the British, okay? This is important. The whole movement has a whole set of alternatives where they're trying to do their own democracy, they're trying to make their own clothes, they're trying to be outside of colonial rule, okay? Then they have the, the, the Indian Independent Congress that is doing all the coalition and structure and community organizing. And then they have the Satyagraha movement, which is essentially the mass protest movement where I told you about the Salt March, okay? Then we say, well, there's integration between these things. And people say, well, how do you know there's integration? Okay, well, I'll tell you one way that we found out through the research that is very interesting. One of the ways that we found out is that in the books of the cooperative of the spinning wheels, where the spin, the, the, you know, they're, because they're doing it cooperative uh, a spinning wheel, there is, they have to say who's doing how much spinning, who's working this, all the stuff, okay? In the records for two years of the salt march, what we found was that there was no record of that. And on the bottom of the freaking paper, it says there were no accounting because everybody in the spinning wheel and the accountants were all in jail for the demonstration for about two years humongous amount of synergy where the people in the alternatives feel and know they're part of the mass protest and everybody on the mass protest know that they have to join the alternatives they have to protect them they have to support them okay i'm going to stop 
because that's essentially that notion of the movement ecology and see if there's any question. It looks a little bit like this. Okay, so this is a whole cycle. This whole thing is one cycle. Mm. Okay, but yeah. usually you have these waves and different seasonality. Sometimes your movement is in the highest moment of a summer versus at a fall and stuff like that. So sometimes what happens is that people de-escalate the movement and the movement goes back into winter. Because really for, to make this engine happen, you need all the theories of change to collaborate. Yeah. You know? I don't know if that makes any sense, right? No, I just want to make sure you understand the collaboration. That's the biggest. Okay. Yeah. Statement. So the first one is dogmatism, which is thinking that your theory of change is everything, okay? instead of a useful theory that works with other theories, okay? Because of that first thing, then the second thing is that there's a lot of individualism and self-sufficiency, meaning that we do not need all the other theories of change, you know? People in community organizing have a humongous resistance to personal transformation. I don't know if you've seen this before. They're like, I don't want to go to those retreats because they're maybe a little, sometimes afraid of opening up, you know? and see what's really going on internally there, you know? There's humongous amounts of resistance, and because of that, there's a sense of self-sufficiency that doesn't allow people to really lean into the other organizations that are you doing things differently. Okay, but now let's get to the, jum, to the yummy stuff. Personal versus collective is one of the first tensions that happens on the movement ecology. So if you see there, everyone else is really alternative. Like, uh, and also we can always, you know, share more of these resources, but this stuff on the movement ecology, a lot of movements come up with a different way of talking about this with different language. So for example, in the India, some of the, the people that, that kind of wrote about the Indian independence movement talked about um, this in a different way. They, for example, talk about it as the constructive program is the alternatives. And personal transformation is just part of the constructive program. You know, it's just fit into within there. Then there is the then there is the Satyagraha, which is the essentially it's the the rest, you know, the mass protests and all the stuff. And I think they um, yeah, I think that I think I'm missing one of those two. And I think the other one might be the the mass protest might have a different one. But they have different wording of how to say that. Now, because our world is so individualized over the last like it's so much more intensely, I would say over the last maybe 50 years, now personal transformation sees itself different from alternatives, okay? But in movements in the past, it usually was part of the same thing, okay? And really the tension is between the personal and collective, okay? There's a tension about that, whether change happens individually or collectively. And of course, what we say is change happens in both ways. People can change and institutions need to change and they both need to change. So that's the one big tension. Usually people in personal transformation hold that because it's easier to hold a personal transformation sometimes and it's harder to hold the collective transformation because that involves, of course, a big introspection about one's privilege and one's place in the world and what one's responsibility it is, you know, collective healing, so forth and so on. So that's the first distinction and tension that happens in the movement ecology, okay? So it'd be good just to say that change happens personally and collectively and that they need both. Uh, the next one is between engaging dominant institutions and it's usually a conflict between alternatives and the other structure mass protest and inside game. There is a, there is a huge tension that you do not need to engage the state or, and, and when we say the dominant institutions, we mean the government and the, 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 the corporations on the market. That's what we mean by that, okay? And when, we, and when we say engagement, I just wanna make sure that you really understand what I mean by that, that I'm not saying that you go and you kiss their booties to, you know, they're like, oh, we're gonna take your land. And you're like, oh, of course, you know, that, that's not what I mean by that at all. What I mean is that you're in an engagement in a very tense relationship to figure out how to maneuver them for jurisdiction of your alternative, okay? Whether you're in a community or particular thing. What we notice with a lot of alternatives, particularly here in the US and in some parts of the world too, is that alternatives, because they have to compete in the global market, they actually have a humongous hard time surviving because the market is trying to get them out of the competition. You know, So figuring out how can the movement support the alternative so that they can survive, it's so important. But there's usually a tension about that. I think 
there, of course, and I'm sure you'll see some of this stuff, there are some alternatives that are really revolutionary and alternatives that are not. And I think some people have the capacity to really isolate because of the resources and money that they have to build alternatives that I don't know if they're really, really alternatives, but that they can isolate from the rest of society because of privilege or capacity to do that. It also happens in other communities. I work with people in the Amazon. And as I was sharing with you last week that I work with indigenous communities back in my country and people in the Amazon can also isolate. They have the capacity to isolate from a lot of things in, you know, deep within the forest. So it's not just around just, you know, financial privilege, but just capacity to isolate. But we again say that we need both. We need to engage dominant institutions and we need to build alternatives. And it's a tension relationship. In Rebecca Tarlow's book of the MST that I think I put the link of there, they call it co-governance. That's how they call what they do in the inside game. They say what we're trying to do is to do co-governance. We're trying to co-govern with the state. And, in, and they say it's the most tense part of the MST work because it's complete tension about the jurisdiction of the MST and of the Brazilian state. So that's the, the fourth one. And the fifth one is the inside versus the outside game. I think I, I forgot this person's name that asked the question, but I'll remember it in a second. I, I cannot see your, your name anymore. It's so sad, but I'll come back to it later. But, uh, but you were mentioning, you were asking about this question and there's a huge tension. Now, if you look at the pie, which part of the pie gets the most, most funding and resources? The inside game. If you've been around philanthropy or no philanthropists, they love the inside game, right? They build these humongous organizations with millions of dollars in their budgets because they need more advocates to go to Washington DC will be my case to go and talk to people about the issue. And if you just talk to them enough and give the politicians enough research, they'll eventually give you what they want because what they're doing is just because they don't know, right? So there's this humongous think tanks to get built around the inside game. And that's why there's this humongous tension around the inside game because the inside game, what I tell people, everyone here that tells me we need more inside game is I say to them, we right now already have enough inside game. We need better people on the inside game. We need one or two. Really, that's all we need per issue at the most. Okay, maybe a couple more, but that's, it's not that complicated, okay? Because really, at the core of it is that you don't have power to negotiate in the inside game. To negotiate on the inside game, you need leverage from the outside game. Okay, if I, like right now in what's happening in the U.S. is that all the mayors... In the, particularly in democratic or, or particular constituencies where there's a lot of people of color, black and brown people in my country, all the mayors are moving outside. They don't want to touch the police. So what's happening is that the protests on the outside is generating all this leverage that people on the inside can turn. So for example, I have a friend um, that it's part of a city council in Minneapolis that I know her for a long time, and they're passing resolutions to try to get the police to not have relationships, to cut a contract from the police from the school department, okay? They're doing all this stuff from the inside. They're channeling the power of the outside in the inside and their relationship with the movement about that. It's a tense relationship, don't get me wrong, but they're understanding that the outside is changing the weather for issues that they've been pushing for years from the inside, okay? So there's a tension about that and usually there is a people on the inside, there's a lot of people on the inside that hate the outside game because they say those rowdy people that are making conflicts and are messing with my relationships. And it's a very individualistic view of the inside game because you're not as an individual, you're representing a constituency. And you don't understand that the constituency has to move and create conflict in order to change the power dynamics for you to negotiate. And then what you have to negotiate has to be good for the movement so that we can keep building over and over again. Instead of getting poor concessions, that only demoralize the movement, okay? So again, as I said, it gets the most resources and it wants to be isolated, particularly because philanthropy doesn't really wanna fund revolutionary stuff, right? Of course, why would you wanna fund mass protests? Why would you wanna fund this community organizing? They're gonna you know, rattle the cage. That's what they do, right? So that's why there's a tension. And there's a tension on the outside groups that they don't wanna have an inside game 
because they feel they're going to get co-opted. But it's, it's like a, you have to be in relationship with your enemy. You have to understand what they're thinking. You have to have your own position, right? So I also work with a lot of uh, marginalized communities that don't have, it's the, the, uh, for example, I, uh, I've, I've been having the pleasure of working with formerly incarcerated, mostly black women and, uh, and girls that have been in prison for unjust reasons and don't believe in a world with prisons. And they're building their inside game with them, with their, because it's their own issue leading it in that way. So it's always, you have to figure out how to do the inside game differently. That's always the tension that we have there. Okay. So again, it's slide 105. That's a quick summary of where we get stuck. Dogmatism, individualism, personal versus collective, engagement or non-engagement of dominant institutions, and the inside versus the, power, the outside game, right? So only powers on the inside, only powers on the outside. Actually, powers on both. Okay, so I'm going to take a deep, deep breath. Everyone can take a deep breath with me. And we're going to summarize so for one, two minutes so that we can go into now questions. So let's take a deep breath. And we talked last week, and we talked a little bit for an hour and some change today about some of these theories of change. Uh, I said to you from the beginning that individual organization and movement, there's a breakthrough path to understand whether you need a movement or not. And for us, there's a lot of definitions for movement. One useful definition that we offer is a movement is a collection of organizations working on a larger issue for a larger objective, whatever that is. Whether your objective is revolutionary or is strategic or not, that's a different question, okay? But for us, that's what a movement is. But most people don't have a movement breakthrough. They're still operating that my own organization is the only thing that matters and the other people I don't know, or Karen sus cosas, let them do their own thing, or maybe their competition or not, right? So again, you have to have a movement breakthrough. Once you have a movement breakthrough, we have to operate in a movement strategy is different than organizational strategy. It's just two different directions. And part of movement strategy is four things, right? I said to use about scale, collaboration, and the two bigger ones that it's so important to talk is about multi-strategic which is what we talked about the last two days is just that, multi-strategic, is that there's five theories of change. You can break them down in more if you would like, right? It's just a matter of how you wanna organize this for your own country and your own traditions and organization. And what we notice is that most movements fail, one particular failure that they have, besides all the other things that their opposition is trying to to, to, to them, is that they don't have multi-strategy. They lack a strategic capacity. They can only do one or two or they can do a little bit, but they cannot maximize. A strategic capacity is using all of the theories of change and making them have synergy, okay? That's what it is for us. That's what makes a movement really move through the cycle and really become, but it's complex. It requires nuance, it requires commitment, so forth and so on. And of course, we also talked about movement seasonality. There, we do a whole two, three days on that stuff. That's a whole other monster to understand how to map the movement and all that stuff. That's another thing. But again, I just want to clarify that really we only work in one pillar, which is the strategic part. And this is just the beginning of that. So I'll stop there and see if there's maybe any questions and comments. And then we can do that for 20, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Will that be okay? Beautiful. So let's talk about time for a second now that that's the first question. And I hear this a lot um, in a lot of movement spaces around the time that we have. And um, one of the things that I want to, I, I, I just want to say, I understand what all of you mean. You know, I, um, you know, I can tell you from my country in Peru, what we're going through with climate change, you know, and the, and the moment in colonialism that we're in right now, you know, and that the world is in right now. So I understand the, the need for urgency and the need that we do not have time. So I just want to first for you to understand that I do know that. And as a young person, I understand that my life and the life of my generation is different because of that. Right. So what I think it's what I think sometimes in movements, what is missing is that we don't have a sense of craft. This is really, really important. What do I mean by craft? A sense of practice and theory and how they apply through you doing it over and over again and knowing that in this game we're trying to build proficiency 
It is not enough just to have ethics personally, but it's about building organization and building capacities that can do personal transformation, mass protests, that can do the movement and the revolution. We need craft, praxis. Now, the, in the capitalist madness society that we have on today, they don't, they discredit all that we do and they say that what we don't have is craft. And I don't know if you notice that all the comments are about that. They're like, you just, you know, go home. They don't understand that there's a strategy to protest. They don't understand it's a strategy to organizations. I'm sure a, a lot of you, a lot of you family members, they don't understand any clue of what you're trying to do. For them, you're just wasting your time because you should be making money and figuring stuff out, right? That's what the capital system does to anything that is outside or it's against the status quo. It delegitimizes this and it takes the craft and the intention and the resources that actually takes us for us to transition this world into a world of justice. Because that's all that we're really trying to do. We're trying to transition this world, which is in a very bad place, into a place of justice, of care, of reciprocity, where we're closer to Mother Earth, where there's equality, where we don't have the madness of racism and sexism and all this violence that we have going on. At the end of the day, that's what we're trying to fight for, right? So because we sometimes forget about craft, we don't understand how long things take. And for me, wisdom is knowing how long things take. That's why my elders, my indigenous elders tell me, you're too young. You won't understand until you're 60. In, my, in, the, in the traditions that we work with, my, my mentors in Guatemala tell me, in our community, wisdom is only achieved after you're 49. Before that, you confuse wisdom with passion all the time. They tell me that all the time, and I agree with that. I'm just a young person. I'm 34, growing into that, right? But what I mean by that is that Seeing a process and knowing how long things take is very important and having craft is extremely important. Why? Because every, there, uh, I don't know if you like this great uh, communist prophet, his name is Bill Gates. Of course, he's not a communist prophet, but I threw his name there. Bill Gates has a great quote that whether I like him or not, I don't really like him, but you know what I'm saying? He has a good quote and that maybe one of you should appropriate and then I can just quote you. But he says, we, under we overestimate what we can do in one year and we underestimate what we can do in 10. I'm going to say it again. We tend to overestimate what we can do in one year and underestimate what we can do in 10. Again, I told you, I'm not a fan of Bill Gates. So I mean, uh, none of those things. But what I mean by that is that sometimes in movements, because we don't have craft, we tend to, not make the movement have progress, but make the movement repeat the first and second year over and over again, over and over and over and over again, because we don't have craft, because we're impatient, because there's no time, because the world's burning, because it's issue, you know? Now, I say that, and again, I told you from the beginning that I'm grounded in social movements. So my experience is from people that are incarcerated, people that are, I'm an immigrant, from people not having papers, from us struggling with a lot of shit in life. So I'm not saying to people, wait for justice. That's not what I'm saying. I just want to make sure you understand that to be clear. What I'm saying is that justice doesn't take a day. It takes at least 10 years. But it really matters what you do in the 10 years. So I make this beautiful graph here that you can see. I don't know if it's beautiful. But if this is year one or year two is still here, year three might be here. Year five might be here. You're preparing for this. I don't know if that makes any sense. We have to see where the cycle of it develops. We have to plan long term. I understand. We don't have time. We have 12 years. That's what the IPC says, right? Great. Well, what is the plan for the next six years? If the plan for the next six years is just to freak out every year, then there's no plan. Then we're wasting six years. So we have to plan. And we have to understand that it takes us a year to get on the same page. You might be like, no, Carlos, we need to get on the same page this month. I understand you think that's how things are. But I, you know, I, I, you know, I spend a lot of time now when I, with a lot of young people working with them. And young people feel sometimes, and I work with a lot of them, that you put a seed today and tomorrow you're going to pick up the fruit. And I'm saying that's not how nature works. That's not how time works. It takes time. Every seed had its own time. 
but you have to cultivate it because if you don't give it the water and the care, the seed, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. You waste resources, you waste seeds, you waste time. So what if this next year in Ireland, we just get on the same page and we do a bunch of retreats for a year and we don't do shit. But we need to take action. I know, but the action we're taking isn't strategic. We need to make it a strategic. For that, we have to take time to build relationships, plan, develop plans, get on the same page, fight with each other, solve conflicts, because the movement stuff is hard. The movement stuff is hard. If you think it's easy, you're in the wrong issue. You're in the wrong life. This shit is hard. I have people that I met 15, 18 years ago when I started this that I don't talk to anymore because they are in the inside game and we don't talk anymore. I can tell you this is hard. Okay. But I try to figure out how to talk to them because we have to, but it's hard. Okay. So I'm going to stop there on the question of time because it's so important on how you align everything. Now the people in the inside game, do they, are they accountable to the movement? Yes or no. If they are not accountable, then you have to figure you're dealing with other politicians essentially. Right. So you have to figure out how to dance with them in a different way. But if they are accountable, that's a different question of how you want to engage relationship with them. But just to give you a sense, in, in the movement that I was part of young people here, we will take over the organization's lobbies, even to move the inside game in that way. So there is so many ways but the tension with the inside game has to always be if there's no tension, there's no good inside game. You know, I don't know if that makes any sense. So whether you're dancing with them a little bit, you're, but you have to know that you need the inside game eventually. And if you're not prepared to what you want from the state, when the state is being like, I don't know what to do. We just want to restore things back to normal. So somebody asked a question around um, cross movement support. So I guess uh, in light of the, uh, of everything that's going on right now. So they say, what about cross movement support? I think this would be a good time for a breakthrough in the environmental movement to work actively on being anti-racist and inclusive. Um, yeah, so that was something as well. There was something else that echoed that around working together. So uh, people that might have the same issue, but with different aims. So yeah, I think that came up a little bit in the chat box. If you mind speaking to that. Thank you. Um... What I say to people here in the United States, if you're in an organization, I work mostly with organizations that are people of color. Okay. That's who I work with. Okay. What I say to organizations that are led or their base is primarily white or their, uh, uh, or I don't know what's, how do you break racially in your country? You know, whether it's migrant or black immigrants or Af I don't know how you do the breakout in your country racially. But what I say to everybody is that everyone needs to be in relationship and have a relationship with a sister organization that is migrant black or brown organization. And they have to spend a significant amount of time in there talking about what issue affects them and how they can build relationships with. So what I mean by that is that um, what happens is that in this moments of mass protest, right, we can all take some personal activity, donating, going to the streets, I don't know if that makes any sense. And that is all great. And organizations should be taking the lead of the organizational leaders that are organizing that movement, right? To take what the guidance is, because that's respectful, because it's their issues, what affects them, right? And do what they say that is, okay? So follow their guidance and stuff like that and get their members to support, endorse, donate, educate, a lot of things that we can do for the cross. Because when people say cross movement support, really the biggest tension is around race or it's around European versus non-European across the world, okay? Just to be completely honest. So a lot of it, so that's a lot of what we can do in a moment of the world when, on where there's a mass protest. That's one thing that we can do, get them to endorse, do education, talk about, because people need to understand what each other's are struggling with. And that's part of the question of relationship. But sometimes in this moments of the world, when we ask a lot from organizations without enough relationship, and I forgot who was a gentleman, Michael, that said that we need trust. And a lot of trust needs to be developed in building relationships because it's not how you maybe put your, whatever thing you can do online. It's really, are you in deep dialogue with those affected communities? And are you being reciprocal? Are you showing up? Are you given resources? Are you learning with one another? And are you learning about the larger issues? You know, So that, that's what I say basically, and it's just a structural. If you're not doing it, then you're always gonna be isolated. 
you have to, within your context, so for example, here in the United States, as I said, for the organizations that are predominantly white, I said, who are the migrant or black organizations? Who, just give one or two that you're just in deep relationship. That you talk to them, you know, they, they know you not just because you're different. They know something deeper, a relationship that, that you guys talk. You guys, when they need support, they come to you. You don't yell at each other all the time. You're talking. You maybe yell at each other first, but now you're talking, you know? So we need some, and I know sometimes there's fear in doing that because there's judgment and all those things, but we just have, that's the messiness of this stuff. It's messy, you know, um, for everybody, you know, for everybody, you know, I can tell you for me as a man, it's difficult working with the women's organizations. It, it takes, I have to recognize my own privilege and my own patterns of dominance, right? So there's a recognition, but that's the process of transformation. So I'll stop there, but that's, we need a lot more relationships between organizations, cross movements, for there to be more things that we can do together, right? And in moments of the whirlwind, we have to just follow the guidance of the movement and educate people and, you know, take that opportunity. Right now, everyone should be doing a workshop on race, on our decriminalization of black people. I think everyone should be doing that. And, you know, and you do it with your own people and your members might be like, that's uncomfortable, but that's, that is exact. Without that, you cannot get them to move later. It takes time to educate people because it's a process. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, um, usually organizations meet at the wrong time. And I'm sure you notice this, that it's like somebody on the inside game really needs to figure out how to get the movement's approval on something. They get everyone on the room and everyone fights to the teeth because there's, of course, very little trust and relationship and time and everything is rushed. And then people have a lot of fights. Have people experienced this before? Just raise your hand if you experienced this before, right? So at the end of the day, we never really talk, but now they need us to talk. So let's just talk, right? So just, just, to, just to share with you, Adam, I think what I noticed, and I know that might be a little bit different right now in, in the pandemic time that we're in. So I don't know, we need to figure out how to do that in this moments. But what I would notice is three retreats and at the regional level, if particularly at the density. So some movements don't have a lot of organizations. I think the environmental movement have hundreds of hundreds of organizations. So you have to figure out how can there be meetings at the local or regional level for people to do cross dialogue. And a lot of the, what I would say is like, some of it has to be training and education around a framework so that people can have a discussion. So part of what we're trying to do with the theories of change is like, it's just a framework. You can take it or leave it. We don't really care, but it's just to have dialogue. That's really what it is for. It's not to make you choose what's the demand. That is really all contextual based on your issue and your struggle, but really to have a framework. And a lot of uh, the organizations have a framework to have a strategy to conversation. So some of the first meetings are just about training people and being like, hey, let's train about having new language. And there's a lot of frameworks, you know? So what are some other frameworks? This is one, there's others as well. What are other frameworks for? So a lot of it has to do first with training. Okay. Then, so that could you do one retreat on that or a training on that or one or two, you know, do some webinars, some sessions on that. Then I think it would be great to just do one retreat where it's just about building relationships. And people sometimes when I say this, look at me and they say, but we have no time. And I'm like, I know, but tell me this one or two is going to keep you lasting for some time. Who are you? What's your name? Why are you here? What? So, and, and really, doing some deep sharing of who one is, you know, we do a lot of uh, narrative and storytelling, Adam, to tell each other stories, to know why we're even here, why, you know, because everyone probably thinks everyone else is just here for other reasons, but really what is the core reasons about why you're here? Why is it in your heart that you're trying to fight for other people? You know, why, 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 why? If I don't know, I cannot trust you, right? That's the basis of trust. I need to know that you're vulnerable so that I can be there for you. And for us, vulnerability is the key to interdependence. Without it, there's no interdependence. Because how can I be interdependent with you if, or if you are not vulnerable? You have to show me that you need me, and I have to show you that I need you. That's the premise of interdependence, is that we are codependent in some ways of one another. We need each other, right? So once you do that, then I think it's, that could be another retreat. Then the next one could be about what are you doing? Give us a report. What are you working on? We do this, we do that. Okay, take, take 30 minutes, two sessions, breakouts. What are you doing? We don't know. 
I mean, again, I just want to say most people don't know what other people are doing. Everyone assumes from what they're seeing in social media, but we don't really know what people are fighting, what people are struggling with, what they're working on, what projects they have. Do they have money? They don't have money. Are they struggling? Is that, orga is that organization about to die? Maybe we should, you should do a ceremony to let them die because some organizations should die so that new ones can be born, right? So that, and then later you can talk about strategy and strategy as a whole. I would say only focus about debating what is the major objective of the movement. That's it. Have one or two retreats on that. You will see that people are going to struggle that with that question. It's a complicated question. Now, it's not so everyone agrees, but it's so everyone knows where everyone is. So everyone hears each other's points. Does that make some sense? Again, you're just making, you're just getting the soil ready for the struggle. That's really what the first retreats are about. But you need a lot of retreats. And most people push back because they're like, we don't have time. You have to retreat. Okay. It's 2.16. I have passed my time. I just wanted to, before I pass it to the, to the team here that is leading this call, I just want to say thank you for listening to me for two times. I know Zoom is hard. But I just want to wish you the best stuff, uh, the best of luck and the best faith for your work over there in Ireland. Uh, because we do need to change this world. So sending love to everybody. And I'll pass it to the folks that are friends over here.